Hi, everybody. We have Peter Svidler here. He is here to answer lots of very good chess questions from some of the youngest, most talented chess players in the country. And I'm really excited to have you, Peter. How are you doing today? I'm doing fine. Doing fine, yeah. Uh, kind of going from... Yeah, like, I don't know how to finish that sentence. I'm still <laughs> no. about, about <laughs> you know, almost missing almost missing this and actually holding everybody up for about 15 well, no, minutes. No, no, we, we always start like 10 minutes late. This is actually, this is actually early. Usually we start like 45 minutes late. So 15 minutes is like, I'm, we're really crushing yeah, it so far. A... So we got a lot of questions uh, and we got one question a lot of times. Uh, like maybe like four or five people ask the same exact question. Uh, and I don't know, did, if anyone has, I, I, you know, I'll just is say it, it. Is it. Is it, what is my favorite piece? Ex how did you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not from this crowd. I'm pretty sure you got none of those. That, from that was crowd. not the question. Um, yeah. The question dealt with time trouble and time management. Uh, and, that you know, is, gonna, that is interesting to me. Uh, that's not, what people normally ask. I've already seen it in, in this chat as well. So I, yes, I know yeah. you're I know you're not making things up, but it's it's unusual that people are so so concerned with this question. They lose on time every game. Every game a move 12 flag falls. <laughs> um, let me yeah. read some of the specific questions. Somebody said how to improve time management. Um, there was I know Matt, you know what Max you mind if I unmute you and you can kind of talk about it? Because I know you definitely asked uh, about time management. So I'd like to have you talk to Peter directly. You're unmuted. Oh, yeah. Hello. Um, I was Hi, just Mark. wondering, uh, like, in how you, what your recommendations for, like, time management are when you're in a position that you, uh, like, are unfamiliar with or uh, like don't know or if, or, or if you're caught off guard in like preparation or something, like how much time would you go spending in that position versus saving it for like the more critical part of the game, like near the yeah, there's, your, uh, that, yeah, That actually is a very interesting question, yeah. And uh, <clears throat> I have a feeling, you know, if I, if I really let myself go, I could go in like five different directions at once and, you know, we would never see a second question in this, in this show. But... Uh, some personal backstory because it might be a bit relevant. Uh, as a kid, I was a huge time travel addict. I remember I won, uh, it will not sound very impressive, but those are actually considering the town in question is Leningrad slash St. Petersburg. Those were decent tournaments. I won the quarterfinal of the city championship when I was, I want to say maybe 11. Uh, and uh, there was an 11 round Swiss in which I think I counted after the tournament. I was in bad time trouble, I think, in eight games out of 11. And out of the f those eight, I think in maybe three or four, I had about a minute for 20 uh, on, on, an, on a mechanical clock with no increment, obviously. And it didn't, uh, it didn't even bother me. It didn't even bother me necessarily uh, because I knew, like, in those years, you need to have this kind of uh, you needed to have this arcane knowledge of, like exactly when the flag falls, for instance, and that was that was something that you needed to study and you needed to know the like the make <laughs> of the clock and so on. But uh, I generally thought that I mean this is fine. I will think of the opponent on, on on my opponent's time, and I will I will never ever lose on time. And I indeed never. I think I pretty much never lost on time when I was a kid. I, I would occasionally make mistakes and lose games because of time trouble, but. Uh, my confidence was extremely high. That was to do with me being a, a young idiot, but also because I was sort of reasonably good at the game and wasn't playing against people who were good enough to punish me consistently. Um, and then uh, time troubles just kind of disappeared. And the thing is, I'm not trying to hide some trade secrets from you. I, like, I genuinely don't remember exactly what caused the change. Because by the time I got to, I don't know, 17, 18, I, it's not that I would never be in time troubles. I, I would occasionally face, face time trouble, but they, they became f f you know, few and far between. And uh, I, 
I would like to uh, to credit the one of the things like sort of it's it's weird. I still do it even though I really don't know why I do it anymore. One of the lasting things that happened to me uh, in terms of you know lessons that were taught uh, during the two sessions of the Kasparov School uh, uh, that I attended, the very last two sessions of the Kasparov School be be before it was finally disbanded because uh, Gary was, uh, I mean, Botvinnik just was no longer doing it for years before I came in and Kasparov was also becoming busier and busier with other things. Uh, but they did teach us that old Botvinnik uh, method of uh, noting on your score sheet specifically how much time you spent on the first 15 moves. Uh, I don't think they had a fight necessarily. Botvinnik, I think, just gradually... Uh, uh, I mean, he wasn't a very young man by that point. I don't, like, as far as I know the lore of the school... Uh, it wasn't. It wasn't really uh, that they had a falling out. It was just m more of a uh, sort of gradual phasing out due to the fact that Batvinik wasn't really getting any younger and dealing with you know fifteen rowdy-ish kids for weeks on end wasn't his idea of fun anymore. Um, but yeah, Batvinik had this this idea that if you write down on the score sheet the time you spend on the first fifteen moves. Uh, with the idea that you should not be spending more than half an hour on the first 15 moves. This will uh, help you with uh, sort of self-discipline and it will, it will make you more aware how much time you spend in the opening, which should go some way towards uh, solving those issues because you know, by keeping track of things, you, you, you do the idea, at least the idea goes by keeping track of these things, you become a lot more aware of, of how they go. You can sort of start maybe noticing patterns, uh, you know, exactly when instead of half an hour, you spend, I don't know, 75 minutes on the first 15 moves. You also have to realize that uh, that system was suggested to us when the pre prevalent time control was uh, two hours for 40 and but Vinik probably formulated it when time control was actually two and a half hours for 40, which is something you will never, ever see in your careers. <laughs> Even two hours for 40 these days is, you know, takes, takes effort to find, but two and a half hours for 40 disappeared in my lifetime, not even your lifetime. Uh, so, but that, that is something that, that definitely stuck with me. Um, but also uh, uh, another thing that, uh, was suggested to us as a student. Uh, I remember there was a lecture. I'm pretty sure it was a lecture by Dvoretsky who was, during one of the sessions, he was a guest lecturer. And I think Jen has heard has heard me tell this story like 15 times. I'm, I'm like a broken record on this particular topic. But I think it's a useful bit of advice nonetheless. Uh, and Dvoretsky mentioned that in, in passing, he wasn't really basing like the entire lesson on this or anything. But there was something that uh, I think a lot of people underappreciate as a bit of very, very solid advice. And that advice is uh, if you're faced with an unpleasant choice and you don't know, let's say you're really unsure if you're losing uh, and your position is in danger, but you do have a, like a mathematically only move, but you have no idea what that move leads to. The temptation might be to actually try and figure out what it leads to which is a strict misplay, you know, in, in video games terms. <laughs> you absolutely, like, if, if, you, if you're certain, obviously there will be situations where if you tank for half an hour, maybe you will find other options. Uh, but if we're talking about situations where you genuinely have the one option, but it might be losing, for instance, or you might be in trouble, <clears throat> you still have to make that move the moment you establish it's the only move and then think on your opponent's time, regardless of what the conclusion is. Uh, and that will save you untold amounts of time over the course of your career, actually. Because I think we are kind of hardwired not to commit to anything unless we know it's good. Uh, but it becomes very, very irrelevant if you're still going to make that move 10, moves, 10 minutes later. You might be slightly happier making that move, but you have burned 10 minutes on your clock. Uh, and uh, not doing that it will actually be extremely useful. Just conditioning yourself never, never ever to do that. 
but that doesn't really answer uh, answer Marx's question. And the part of Marx's question, which I found very interesting, was he specifically mentioned something I was going to mention in the answer anyway. Uh, I think uh, the way to deal with time troubles and the way to improve at not getting into time troubles um, is we'll have a lot to do uh, with uh, understanding and sensing what the critical position in the game is. Unfortunately, I can give absolutely no advice as to how to train that, apart from playing a lot of chess. I think this is just something that comes with practice. You, I, I, like I'm, maybe there are some people out there who know of what exercises exercises could could help you with that. But genuinely, like if you let's say if you try solving, the issue with solving is. By, by the very nature of solving a study, you know that the position they gave you is a critical position. So you know you have to invest time and energy into finding the best move there. That's like why they gave you the position. Whereas in the game, there will be, like in the 40 move game, there will be probably 30 moves where even if the best move actually exists, the second best move will be barely distinguishable from the best move in terms of your expected value. And you know the, the the evaluation will not change very much if you make the second best move, and there will be those I don't know five to ten moves, five to ten critical critical situations in the game, where if you if you actually miss that you had to, that you really had to concentrate and find the best move there, that will potentially lose you the game, or it will make the game take a turn take a turn for the worse, and. Yeah, sadly, apart from saying this is a very important skill, I can't really, I can't really suggest how you train it apart from, apart from you know, paying attention during games and maybe after the game, perhaps let's say if you catch yourself missing something important uh, after the game, you sort of you come back to that moment and you think. I kind of relaxed here. I decided that it's really not that important for me to to think very deeply on that particular decision. And I made a move quickly and it turned out that there was an important nuance I missed and that made everything go sort of sharply downhill and uh, try to figure out what the reason was for you uh, missing the thing. But yeah, I, this is, you know, one of the, one of the reasons why I've been generally uh, in particular this year when, you know, there's not a lot of practice, uh, you know, you move at least for, for me, there was not a lot of chances to to play chess, but there was a lot of offers suddenly for me to go into some form of teaching. And I've been sort of saying no to all of them, or pretty much all of them, because I feel a bit fake trying to teach when, you know, whenever I try to talk about any kind of a subject like this, eventually, you know, five minutes in or 10 minutes in, I just hit the block where I say, okay, so this is the problem. I have no idea how you solve it. <laughs> and uh, apart, from, apart from, you know, becoming 45 and, uh, and amassing, you know, the wealth of experience you will amass by the time you're 45, uh, which is not very helpful to you. <laughs> uh, so I think the best I can do in most of these cases is tell you uh, what you should be sort of striving for and, you know, what the critical things to look out for are. But yeah, I, I, I don't think I actually have a solution to the question that was asked, uh, apart from uh, mm, trying to kind of discipline yourself not to tank too much in the openings, uh, listening to us. Like in particular, once again, another facet of the, the, the question Max, uh, Max, Max asked, uh, dealing with novelties in the openings. Uh, sometimes the novelty will be of such quality that you will just know that if you make a mistake here, you die. And then you absolutely do have to tank. But often if somebody surprises you with something you haven't been prepared for, it just sort of, it shakes you off balance, but it doesn't really threaten your entire game at this one moment. And you should probably teach yourself to, to identify those moments and to uh, teach yourself to, you know, not wallow in self-pity for too long because that's really not very helpful. 
you spend, you know, your one minute saying to yourself, why haven't I prepared for this, you idiot, you know, like I do, like I normally would definitely spend a minute or two cursing at myself softly. Uh, but then you just find something that looks attractive. For me, generally, when I face a novelty, I try to identify, uh, first of all, you, you kind of try to figure out uh, what the expected response is and how dangerous it will be for you to go down the absolute main stem. Like you normally have an idea what the main reply to the novelty is, and that's generally will be what they prepared for. So you have to make a choice of whether actually to allow all this or to try and look for a move that will be uh, a bit of a sideline, probably not the best move in the position, but maybe something that they haven't analyzed so deeply. And you need to make those, you need to make those considerations quickly. And uh, for me, I generally like to, uh, to play something slightly, uh, you know, off kilter to, to as, as soon as possible, you want to try to take the game to sort of an equal ground where you don't know anything and they hopefully also don't know anything. Uh, and I probably should stop talking as well because that, that has been one question I think I've already... Yeah, <laughs> we can go back to it. Um, I, I do have a question that's related to that real quickly. Sure. That I've always wondered about. Uh, so you see somebody like uh, Grishak, right? Mm -hmm. Who gets in... I'd say like legendary time travel problems his whole career. Mm -hmm. How much do you think that holds him back, if at all? It's it's very difficult to say because, like, I mean, I mean, the the obvious answer would be, you know, he would be like, I don't know if world champion material, but definitely like a challenger challenger material in terms of mm -hmm. his natural gifts. If he just didn't have that issue, but I think. You know, he belongs to a very different school of chess than I do, despite, of, you know, both of us, we are not very different in age. And uh, uh, we, we do definitely all both belong to, you know, we've been taught by Soviet teachers and so on. But he is very much of the, I need to find the best move in the position school of thought, where I have always been and will remain until I stop playing. I've, I've, I've always been... Uh, a kind of a guy who, you know, says to himself, this looks good enough. I'm done looking. Uh, I'm sort of satisfied with how this looks. Uh, let's just make a move and move on. And uh, for somebody like him, who is genuinely very interested in looking for quote unquote absolute truth, uh, you know, telling him, you know, Sasha play faster, you'll become world champion in two years is, you know, probably not very helpful because he would need to change his entire MO. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, for uh, for somebody who has had tremendous amount of success playing the way he's been playing, uh, if you change something, which I firmly believe is like a, the bedrock of how he approaches playing chess, and that is approaching pretty much every single position if it's, uh, as if it's a critical position, uh, it might break something. If you tell him not to do that, it might break something in, in the way he uh, he approaches chess and he might actually start playing worse. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. It's it's a weird one because, I mean, he's not doing this for joy. He's not, he's not I don't think he's deriving any particular happiness out of, you know, the, 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 the playing on increment in every single game. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's definitely had, you know, game, he, he, through games by through not in the you know corruption sure, sense sure. Before, but like he uh he, he definitely has had games which were completely derailed by his uh horrendous time issues but i'm getting a related question too like uh nepam Niachi seems mm -hmm. to be almost the exact opposite of yeah he is uh... very quickly yeah he he, he does be, he, he he definitely trusts his uh uh, his uh, sort of natural understanding of where things go a lot more than Sasha does. And uh, once again, you can find plenty of examples of Nepo just like blitzing one move too many mm -hmm. and and the game ending and, and, and he's sitting there, you know, looking kind of silly because he didn't think for even like five minutes on a decision where he definitely needed to. But yeah, it's it's just so personal. You You, you can't really... In particular, uh, when you talk of players of, you know, their general magnitude, which is like, like 
genuine like top five material uh it's just so difficult to generalize and to you know prescribe things which will work uniformly well for anybody uh, for for everybody uh, mm -hmm. i think jan would probably benefit from playing slightly slower and uh, sitting on his hands a little bit more and and sasha probably would benefit by uh trusting himself a little bit more and you know not going for the you know third and the fourth round of calculating the thing the same thing over and over again but so we need to combine them both and they will be world champions sort of yeah probably magnus watch out um i actually have a question for y'all but I, I need to know koskia can i um share my screen is that is that something okay, that works or, or you're not set up for it because the question i have is like basically what well, i can try okay so the question is basically what are some like underrated openings um, number one for white against e4 e5 against the sicilian and for black just in general like just openings that are like you think they're like pretty decent but that nobody really plays for some reason and uh, i don't know you, if that's a know, tough question but i'm gonna you share know, you, you know i have a perfect i have a perfect answer for this right which will which will just uh can people see the board by the way did i do it correctly uh yeah i could okay. have also done this from my end but i'm not i'm not sure well let's hear your uh, perfect let's hear your perfect answer uh, Jen actually asked a prediction. Uh, is running a prediction in chat now, and I like people should be people should be able to get this in like. This thank is you. it. Thank you. <laughs> yes, I mean you you could have you could have given the kids slightly more slightly more time to get right. that in, but I fear it's an obvious. Uh, and I mean and I mean like I don't even mean this in, entirely as a troll either. I think Scandi is better than than the reputation it normally has. When all right, we need to stop the meeting. I'm sorry. This is... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> end this right now uh yeah uh but I i'm also like i'm sort of on the record i've i've done this extremely boring speech uh in 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 previous uh in previous situations like this where you know people would ask me like is is the mora for instance a playable a playable thing to play against uh, the sicilian and just to show and, what the more is so. yeah and i mean i mean the simple uh the simple answer is is actually yes up to a certain level i'm pretty sure it is playable uh but uh my my extremely you know soviet approach to this and in particular when i'm talking to a group of kids who are you know gifted and and already quite good at the game and are trying to become better is that uh, yes, there are shortcuts like this, which will help you, you know, which will dramatically cut down on your preparation time. Uh, and uh, I think that's sort of one of the biggest advantages of, of let's say, adopting something like the Scandi against 24 or the Smith Mora against, uh, against the Sicilian is that you just absolutely destroy the need to differentiate between the Nidorfs and the dragons and you know the Sveshnikovs and the Paulsons of this world because you just don't you just don't let them play them uh, uh and uh that that just so dramatically cuts down on the amount of information you're supposed to consume to be able to play the open Sicilians uh but what it also does is uh uh is that it, it it hinders your development very, very significantly because you you don't get to experience playing the open Sicilian, uh, and uh, I think you, you, here you kind of have to differentiate. You you, you have to uh, ask yourself what what your sort of medium and long term goals are, uh, because if if let's say what you need is a new opening for one tournament. Uh, and uh, you're you're willing to invest into something like this for one tournament. It's one thing, but if you uh, if you just spend years and years playing something like this to the exclusion of everything else, you are uh, depriving yourself of an opportunity to learn uh, to learn all kinds of uh, pawn structures that will you eventually will have to you will have to have practice with them. And if you don't start when you're young, it it will be an issue uh learning them when you're much older uh so i am generally uh very much in favor of playing you know quote unquote uh 
classical openings because i think you need you need that experience and you need starting getting uh, you need to start getting that experience as early as possible uh but yeah when we talk about underrating uh, underrated opening everything is playable these days up to a point uh, people in chat have been saying that mora has been refuted i mean to a degree but not not i mean like what is what what do you think is the expected rating of a person who will uh see the mora from you for the first time without you know having the benefit of preparing uh to you for like a couple of days you play the mora for the first time so what do you think is the expected level of a guy playing black uh for that guy to actually be sort of a favorite against you playing the mora if you don't if you do know what you're doing there um I mean, Peter Swidler with white versus this chat with black, probably black is favored, honestly, because I like I don't know what I'm doing in the Mora. I have I have spent I have spent zero minutes actually <laughs> learning the move orders. Uh and I I might I might not equalize with white, but but the point is, you know, it's refuted for a given value of refuted, which in case of the Mora probably means that black gets to keep the uh keep the extra pawn and white will have some positional compensation for it but not quite enough uh which is still a, like if you don't care about those things you do have to have a like a healthy disregard for you know material equality and things which i think is a useful thing to have in particular when you're young you shouldn't really be that worried about you know uh, playing unbalanced positions and positions which are probably not entirely correct I can just, I ask, though, sure. since you're talking about the Mora, another problem I've always found is people can just transpose into, like, some yeah, kind of Yeah, neither six, I guess, yeah. yeah. This is usually the main line against C3. So what I'm, what I'm trying to say is on C3, knight F6 is a very popular move and mm -hmm. considered okay for black, right? Sure, yeah. And course, so when yeah. you play the Smith Mora, they can do it anyway. And they yeah, but just... the, the thing is, the Sicilian players really, really hate the Alapian players. Oh, really? And I think, like, for me, I would genuinely, like, the Latin players are, I think, not very widely spread amongst the top players. So it hasn't been a very, you know, large problem for me in my career. But mm -hmm. I can tell you that if I see that I'm playing against somebody who plays E4, C5, C3, I am probably not playing E4, C5. Oh, wow. Uh, and I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one. Uh, so for me, just, this wouldn't, uh, this wouldn't be such a discouragement anyway, because I think, uh, you know, the Sicilian players probably want to play their Sicilians and not their Latin. Uh, so yeah, I don't know, but we've already, like, once again, I've gone down some kind of a weird rabbit hole and this wasn't really what the question was about. Mm, underrated openings against one E4. I mean... Pretty much everything is playable. The Caro is definitely very mainstream these days. Obviously, I mean, E5, C5 is playable. Uh, the French, like I personally should not be playing the French with either color. I have no idea what mm. I'm doing. But uh, there is nothing, you know, intrinsically wrong with the French. I th Like, f there are some things wrong with the French, but it's a playable opening and you can... Uh, you know, now you have a benefit of a lot of very strong players recording very decent quality material on the French. So, Rook, we have, have a lot of questions, but I, I want to ask you one slightly related one. Is there any sure. overrated openings? Like openings that people play and they're known to be good that you think, yeah, I don't really like this opening so much. I think that's very personal. I think, uh, like, there are things that don't suit me uh, personally as a player. Like, for, for me, the example would be Although I don't think you can count it as an overrated opening because uh, uh, it's these days not very overrated. It's sort of disappeared from top grandmaster practice. But in the mid 90s, I had a brief period where I tried to become a King's Indian player with black. Mm -hmm. And it just did not work for me. It turned out I just have no natural aptitude for those structures. Uh, I, I had decent-ish results because I was like generally okay at chess, so I could like work my way uh, work my way out of difficult positions. But it just didn't agree with me structurally at all. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I very early on I realized I'm getting the kinds of positions where I'm just sitting there hating every minute of it. 
and for me it's a very very unhelpful situation i like i i know this about myself i really do need to at least slightly like what i have on the board for me to function properly as a chess player not very many people i mean th there's definitely some very strong players in the history of chess who this wouldn't apply to uh, and I think it's a huge, huge advantage if that doesn't apply to you. If you can play positions you don't like trust in, but you can still you can still play well because you think I mean it doesn't matter if the game is not 15 moves long, it's 40 moves long or 50 or 60. So if I'm much worse by move 15 with black, it's irrelevant because I can still outplay the uh, the other guy. But for me, it, it's not that it's impossible, but it's much harder than for somebody like, I don't know, Alexander Morozevich comes to mind, for instance, who was throughout his career extremely capable of playing pretty much anything, uh, provided he put some work into understanding that that anything. And he was very comfortable not being anywhere near equal by move 10 or 15, uh, because he trusted, correctly trusted his ability to uh, to deal with it. Okay. Yeah, and um, also, also, also Dragon, but I don't think anybody overrates the Dragon. There's been a mention of Dragon in chat. I mean, mm -hmm. Dragon is Dragon is playable. The issue with Dragon is, once again, once you start meeting people who are reasonably well prepared, it stops being so much fun. Can I give you, uh, can I ask a question about the Dragon? Would you s characterize it as if you play somebody who's really well prepared, you're going to maybe be very, very slightly worse? And without a fun position? Or is that I don't, I, I don't even know, because like there's those, there's those lines. Actually, if, we, if we're discussing openings, can I... Uh, the, the, we did set up something that would allow me to move the pieces. Oh, sure. We'll let you move the pieces. Can we, can we, can we switch to uh, to that? Hang on. Uh, I'll, stop. Me... I'll stop my screen share. Now you can you can share it. Yeah, here. so... Uh, uh, I, I do have some other questions, but what we can... Uh, yeah, so if, if we talk about dragons, uh, like I, I'm not really up to date... I'm not really up to date on how it stands, right? Because uh, it sort of disappeared. At some point, like Magnus was playing it and Taymor was, play, was playing it and Hikaru was playing it. But then it, it, it sort of went away. And the issue here is that I think a lot of people are just doing this now. And, mm -hmm. and after D5, you, uh, you have this you know, selection of things where you're supposed to be slightly worse. Like there's, there's this line where you, you may be equalized and maybe you don't, right? And very few people actually play E5 in this position these days. Although, famously, Gwen Jones played this against Magnus and was a piece up by move 15 because Magnus mm -hmm. picked something up and then still still lost. Uh, but th the issue is, uh, I, think you, uh, I think you might be uh, losing by force in some of these lines, right? Like I, like, I genuinely don't know if they haven't found a forced win for white somewhere around here. I've never actually studied any of this uh, with either color because it was completely irrelevant to my career throughout my career. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't entirely rule out that, you know, all of this nonsense. I can't even remember the exact move orders, but at some point, you know, G4, HGF4 starts. And like with the, with the current machines, everything is supposed to be a draw, but uh, like, is it, is it really? Uh, I, I, I think, you know, it's never going to be better for Black. I think the question is whether this is a draw, whether, uh, again, somebody extremely well prepared, you just get swept off the board. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, the, the issue with Dragon is that, uh, you know, in the Long Castles lines, I think you're fighting for equality without too much fun. And then the Bishop C4 lines, you know, you might have some kind of a, you know, really terrifying type of fun. <laughs> where you know it's uh it's not for everybody and also i don't think you are guaranteed to survive to my very very limited knowledge once again it has to be prefaced by saying yeah. i haven't and actually looked at this in in just forever to, can i just clarify something because we have players of all different levels here so like you're talking more at the top level like grandmaster international master it becomes difficult because players are well prepared yeah. and you don't get yeah. to do like the fun sacrifices that you might mm -hmm. get against 1900 players 1800 players because they won't know what they're doing you'll catch them in some traps uh, but something like the night orf that it's kind of playable all the way up to the top absolutely yeah night, night orf will be night orf will be playable at at any level and yeah and the, what greg said there it's also like uh, 
you have to make a disclaimer that you know all of these problems I'm describing for Black and the Dragon, they really only do apply once you get reasonably high because uh, up to a certain level, and I I think that level is actually quite high. It's not even like you 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 you're not supposed to stop playing the dragon when you like hit international master or something. Uh, hey, Fabi. <laughs> uh, but uh, up to a certain level, you're perfectly entitled to play all of this because nobody really will know, uh, you know, the opening well enough from the white side to. Uh, for you to be properly scared of it, so. Um, so I'm going to quickly take a question that we got. This is from International Master, who is part of our group, but he's not here today. And his question was, what material and process did you use to get to Grandmaster? And by process, he means, like, how did you spend your time? Like, um, Yeah, it's, it's kind of weird, because I had those couple of years where I made those jumps uh, and uh, I mean compared to this chat I was an extremely slow learner I became grandmaster at 18 uh, I, think, I think that's you know, pretty good that's pretty good I think the, the these days you know like you you I mean it's it's probably still fine but you're you know nowhere near the top or even the middle of the class in terms of mm -hmm. like uh, and, and by the way just to give a heads up I may like since we do have a lot of questions, I may like cut you off after a few minutes. It's like a time trouble test, you know, so we can get to some of the other ones. You don't mind if I do that? Yeah, no, of course not. Of right, course go, not. Go. Uh, but uh, for me, I I had uh, I had my my childhood coach until I was maybe thirteen or fourteen, and then I I worked alone for a couple of years, and uh, I got to international master when I was I think fourteen or fifteen. Mm -hmm. by getting a norm in every tournament I played. And then I sort of stagnated for about two or three years. Uh, and then by 94, it turned out that like all the, all the inside conditions were met. And in 94, I basically, I once again, I got the norm in, in every single tournament I played uh, in most cases by sort of overshooting the norm by, by a point. Uh, but there was no, there was no real, like any, there's no groundbreaking hidden secret that I can tell you on this, on this topic. I, I switched from, you know, my childhood trainer was very, very good at, insp at inspiring love for the game. He was uh, a very, uh, a very good person to, you know, work with young kids where I think making sure that, uh, the enthusiasm doesn't go away is maybe the most important thing. But he left me with a very, very dodgy opening, uh, opening repertoire. I was basically playing the Cole more or less exclusively uh, until I was maybe 13 with white. And this is and not... And the Cole is when you just play like D4. Basically, like... it's, a Meron, it's a Meron with colors reversed. Like you go D4 and you're not even smart enough to play the London. So you go Knight of 3, like E6, E3. Yeah? Like you lock it in. You don't go Bishop F4. You play Bishop D3, Knight BG2. C3 and you push for E3, E4. It's it's pretty much exactly the Marin, the Marin with the colors reversed. And I mean the Marin maybe comes close to equalizing the way it is. So Marin with one tempo up uh, is going to be a fine opening to equalize, but it's not going to be a world beater by you know by any stretch. And uh, between the years of I don't know 13 and 15, I basically self-taught myself to play one E4. Um, I wasn't really, you know, cutting edge. I was playing some Italian, some Spanish, not a lot of it, um, just mixing things up. But I, I knew I had to quit playing the Cole. This much, this much I understood. And uh, uh, I sort of tightened up my openings uh, and I, I played a lot of chess. I played as much chess as I could. Uh, at around maybe the age of 17, I started working with my, my main coach, the, the person who, you know, taught me most things in terms of my professional growth. And he also further well, who finds that coach, just to... uh, it's he, his, his name is Andre Lukin and he's not universally really okay. known in the West, but yeah, he's done. Uh, I'm extremely grateful to, uh, to what he's done for me because uh, hmm, I mean, I probably would have become some kind of a chess player anyway, okay. but uh, once I started working with him, the progress became uh, a lot faster. And I think a year after we started working together, I became a grandmaster. But there is no, you know, hidden, uh, you know, uh, wax on, wax off technique that. Let does me ask any, you, 
Does anyone in this chat even know what I'm talking about when I Max say that? Max on Max off, they might not. Yeah. Karate yeah. Kid reference. Can I ask yeah. a real quick question? We have a question from the, the chat, but I, I do want to ask one thing related to this. Do you think there's one thing that a lot of players get wrong that you see commonly? Like something that young players do that they shouldn't be doing that kind of hinders their progress? That's an interesting one. Uh, apart from the thing that I already mentioned, I, nothing really comes to mind. I really am a firm believer in playing, in playing like major openings. I really do think uh, you will have to do. You will have to eventually, and the earlier you start, the better it is. You know what's uh, funny? But, I started like seven months ago. <laughs> I realized, like, because I would have this problem. I'd, I mean, I talked to this when I was in U.S. Chess Women's before, but I would play, like, openings that I knew they weren't that great, but, like, I knew them well. But then the problem comes, eventually you're going to have to switch. And then all that knowledge you had just kind of, like, out the window. And so now I'm like, I'm going to play something that in 10 years, it's still going to be good. <laughs> and that way, yeah, like, but, long but apart term, from that, fine. apart from that, yeah, it's... Uh... I wish I wish I had a better answer because I'm sure there's like a number of things which, uh, you know, somebody who actually spent time thinking about these things would would be able to, to pinpoint. But mm, that's you know where we once again return to the fact that I, I I do feel like a bit of an imposter here. I am an extremely strong practical player. I have you know some years ago I would be feeling very awkward saying those words. I I have become at peace with that idea. I am so very, very good. I think the fact that you're good at chess, like you're kind of yeah, I'm, 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 I'm very <laughs> good. At, I'm very good at the actual, you know, process of playing chess. Mm -hmm. But, but I am not, you know, by any stretch of the imagination, you know, the deepest thinker about the theoretical aspects of how you work on chess. So, mm -hmm. uh, I am. I've, I've done this like my entire career was based on very, very good natural instincts. I think. So, you know, things that require a, a good, you know, thinking, teaching approach, they probably uh, aren't the things that should be asked of me. Do you think, though, maybe the most humble people are actually the best teachers? If they have something to teach, yes, which, there we once go. again. Really yes, great. yes is the answer. <laughs> Peter is the best teacher. Let's move on. I have a question from one of the students, and I'm going to have them, uh, I'm going to unmute their microphone real quick. Sure. Uh, Mahadi, did I get your name right? Yeah. Okay. Go the ahead. Question is, what got you the biggest boost in your quality of play? Um, was it game analysis, or looking through jam games, or serious end game study, or opening study, or like serious tournament playing, or something else? I think we can rule. If, like for me, it's it's easier when I, when I, when I start on uh, answering that question. It's easier for me to rule things out. Like. Serious endgame study, that definitely is not the answer. Because I don't think I have ever really done any. And I'm, I'm not horrible at endgames, but I am uh, a lot worse, I think, than I am supposed to be considering where I have been in my, uh, in, in, like, the, the, the heights I reached in my career. I really should be better at it. Um, I used to... I think it's becoming a bit of a, a bit, a little bit of a lost art. I don't know what your uh, Jen, Greg. I don't know what your approach to this is when you do teaching, but for me personally, I find that uh, the the analysis of your own games is kind of disappearing. Uh, I think for a very, very simple reason that you know you played a game like when I started playing seriously against stronger position. Let's say it was mid mid nineties. You played an interesting game. You went back to your room and you went through it trying to figure out, you know, what the mistakes were, what the interesting points were. There was also this thing called the post-mortem, which I think has to a large degree disappeared from the top tournaments. And all of this is basically due to the fact that, you know, instead of trying to, you know, find that truth by, you know, sitting down with your opponent and talking about the game for two and a half hours, uh, you can just take your phone out of, you know, storage where the arbiter has it, switch it on and, you know, open chess bomb or whatever. And it will, it will just tell you. 
And uh, even that extremely weak engine will still be very good at pointing out how much of an idiot you were. Uh, and that uh, I think severely discourages, you know, proper introspection and thinking about things you, uh, you've done. And I think it's very, very regrettable. I think analyzing your games was, was a very, very useful tool, which is, once again, I don't know if it's just me being too lazy to do it these days, or if it's like genuinely disappearing everywhere. Uh, I know I'm not doing it properly anymore, but maybe some people are st st still are. I, I can actually give a story about this. Sam Shanklin, who is you know, now a 2,700 FIDE player. Mm -hmm. I talked to him about this. And after his games, he's like, no, I just immediately check what the engine says. Like after his tournament game, the first thing he does, turns on the engine and immediately. Yeah, I, I, I saw that firsthand when we were playing a match. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> and it's not like I'm not criticizing. I'm, I'm. Oh yeah, me neither. I, I, I do that as well, unless I have a feeling that it will really tell me I was an idiot. And then I try to, you know, get like at least two hours of uninterrupted, you know, no self-hatred. Mm -hmm. uh, and, then, and then eventually I will still have to look and, and then, you know, as the quote, I think it would, yeah, that's probably not the reference we need in this chat, but there's a, there's a quote from a TV series that I really, really like and use a lot because it like describes my life uh, very well, very often. And the quote is self-loathing is was strong with him that day. Uh, and yeah, in, in order not to indulge the self-loathing too much, I think Sometimes you just don't look at what the what the phone tells you, <laughs> because you, you know it will flare up immediately. But yeah, I think I think uh, uh, analyzing your own games is incredibly important. Uh, I, I think uh, the the higher you get, the more you regrettably have to work on openings. Uh, but uh, for the purposes of this discussion with uh, you know with the kids we have here today, I suspect. You, you do have to uh, mix other things in because you, you're, you're still going to get to play a game of chess, uh, even if your openings aren't really up to scratch. Like for, for me, I'm, not re I, I'm really no longer really playing in those tournaments anymore. But when I was still playing in the absolute elite tournaments, uh, somewhere around maybe, I don't know, three or probably around the 2017 mark, I just realized that I'm sort of unwilling to put the serious hours studying openings anymore. Uh, but that results in me like genuinely having nothing to play when I play the top events, uh, in particular with white, because with black, I know they will be trying to kill me. And in the process of trying to kill me, they will probably give me opportunities for counterattacks if I survive. But with white, there was this like really desperate feeling of absolute emptiness because mm -hmm. against somebody like Anish, you know, whichever way I open uh, my knowledge against his knowledge, it's extremely likely that he will have to start thinking by move 20 and the position will be dead equal. Okay. Not, just, um, not, not, not just that I will not have any advantage, but it will be dead equal. Uh, whereas, uh, you know, if you go lower down, this is not going to be an issue. So you probably shouldn't be focusing your entire energy on, on openings. You should be, I think solving is another thing I haven't really done properly in my life, but it is extremely useful. Uh, and uh, yeah, just try to, uh, try to get as, as, as well-rounded chess education as you can while you're still young. Studying classics is useful. I understand, you know, this is maybe not the most popular answer, but I, I do believe studying classics is useful. Studying end games definitely will be extremely useful. And there is definitely uh, enough good resources out there to help you with that. Um, so I'm going to move on. Uh, your, sure, sure. <laughs> All right. I did have a comment though, when you made, made your end game comment, somebody said, I thought Russian schoolboys were strong end game players. I'm not horrible, but. So you're not. No. So he's not terrible end game. Strong, strong is not how I would. Strong is not how I would describe my my end game play. No, specifically, what I would say is. Actually, I have a question for you. Simple sure. question. Yeah, so, what's ahead. your FIDE rating right now? Uh, I lost maybe ten points in the super final, so around I don't know twenty seven fifteen. All right. So, what's your FIDE strength at openings? Uh, 
very much depends on the opening, but I would say mm-hmm. that probably, I don't know, these days, 2650 to 2700. All right, how about in end games? End games, I think I'm like 2650 on a good day, maybe 2600. All right, so we found two things that you're lower than your strength at. What is it that you're higher than your rating at? I think I'm a, like, I'm, I'm a genuinely good middle game player. I think I'm, okay. I'm very good. Like, if I get to play a position where neither of us really knows, like, right. if I get to, like, if the, the outcome of an opening is an equal-ish position with steel pieces on the board, mm-hmm. where neither of us really knows uh, the solution, even perhaps if, some, if, if one of us, and that probably is not going to be me, it's going to be my opponent, knows the, you know, the, the answer as in what the evaluation is, but there is no direct way to kill the game completely off. Mm-hmm. I think I'm still pretty good at moving the pieces around. So maybe 2730, 2740? Probably, yeah, I mean, probably higher than that, honestly. <laughs> oh, cool, 2800. 2800. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think that's the I think that's always been uh, that, that's always uh, been you know the one thing that mm-hmm. kind of kept me afloat. So, so the like, trick if, if, the, if the other two if the other two is below twenty seven hundred, this one has to be has to be higher, right? Yeah. So so the trick me. against Peter, play some opening that goes right to the end game, like right away, boom. Pretty much, yeah. And then like be, he's a very, very weak very, player. <laughs> that would be very soul it's destroying. It's easily twenty six fifty then. Um, all right, I, I have a question here. Uh, how do you feel about Blitz? Is it good for you or bad for you? And oh. question two, how about Bullet? Bullet, I understand I'm not, you know, my answer here is not going to suddenly wean all of these kids off Bullet, but uh, there should be, I think, limited Bullet. Like, you, you, you shouldn't really be spamming Bullet all, all, you know, all your, your entire waking, you know, all of your waking hours. I can't really speak English anymore. Uh, like six hours minimum, for, six hours max per day. I would, I would suggest that it's like it's fun, and I sort of understand the attraction, but uh, that actually isn't very productive in terms of improving your chess. I think. Uh, unless what you want to improve is specifically your bullet skills, because I don't know, there's a big bullet tournament coming up, which you want to do well in, but, uh, blitz, blitz, I think is, is quite good. I think, uh, I think blitz is, uh, very good at, uh, you know, honing and fine tuning your instincts and instincts, uh, do need to be, do need to be fine tuned. They do need to be trained and, uh, uh all of those things i you know spoke about at length you know at such length that greg is now instituting a a shot clock for for my answers you know the the time management and uh and and all of these things they will improve if you uh you know if you train your intuition which sounds slightly 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 like an oxymoron but i'm pretty sure intuition can be trained by by putting yourself in situations where uh, you just don't have time to figure things out properly, and you have to trust your your ability and your pattern recognition uh, to to come up with correct solutions. But obviously, once again, uh, w- w- when we talk about this type of practice, uh, you you do have to be like invested in not just trying to win games of blitz, but you need to be invested in in trying to play good good games, games of blitz, uh, just, you know, being faster than the other guy is also a skill. And it's, it's a useful skill in a lot of settings these days when, you know, we all live in a world where most of the practice is online and most of the practice is actually, you know, three plus one and, and faster. Mm -hmm. Uh, but if we talk about developing your chess skills, uh, you do have to, you know, care about what happens on the board, not just that you make passable moves quicker than than your opponent and then and then you just win rook against rook on 10 seconds <laughs> um what was my second question i can't remember uh so we have another question here how important is creativity in chess at the top level seeing how preparation and memorization always seems to trump everything else nowadays and secondly somebody's asked about dubov and 
Like, how is he so creative in chess and how much does that help him? These are two questions, but they seem kind of related. Yeah, they, 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 they are. They are very related. I, I think, uh, you, you know, creativity is what I think maybe distinguishes the, the, the you know, the absolute best from, from the people who will be slightly weaker. Uh, there are still ways of, uh, uh, I mean, preparation at the very, very top level, preparation is king for sure. Uh, you are not going to get very far if you are, you know, if for your guesswork starts at around move seven, uh, as it does for me. I'm using myself very sort of squarely, squarely as an example here. Uh, but uh, there is still room to be creative. Uh, and uh, somewhat depressingly, creativity and uh, Dubov is a good example, but there was definitely a very nice example in my generation for this. Uh, and uh, I've already mentioned that name. Uh, Alexander Morozevich was, I think many people would say, maybe the most creative player of, of my generation. He played all kinds of unbelievably uh, uh, offbeat things. You know, he uh, almost single-handedly returned the French to the top level. He played like the, the, the Albion counter gambit against 2750 plus opposition and so on. You know, he's done lots of seemingly absolutely insane things. And... Uh, uh, the one thing that also that always kind of struck me as being slightly unfair was uh, people would say, uh, look at his games and say, you know, behold, you know, the return of the the genius amateur. Look at how good this guy is when playing this absolute crap, you know, that he obviously kind of thinks of at the uh, at the board. Uh, I, for years and years, had been his teammate on the Russian national team. And we were always on very good terms and we spoke about chess. And I knew sort of firsthand just how much time and effort went into making sure that those completely offbeat things were actually playable. So uh, it's, still, it's still creative work. It still requires you to, you know, uh, set up the chessboard at home and start looking at things which are not mainstream, which are considered bad in many cases, uh, in many cases and so on. But th this creativity has to be uh, coupled with, you know, the desire and preparedness to work. And it also very much applies to Dubov because he is, I mean, clearly an incredibly gifted dynamic, dynamic player who you know, on his day can create absolute masterpieces like that game against Karekin that everybody is now uh, correctly obsessing about. But he also works on chess nonstop, basically. He just never quits clicking. Uh, I, he was in, uh, he was in uh, Yekaterinburg for the candidates doing commentary. And uh, some evenings we would go, I was there as, a, as Alexeyenko's second, and some evenings we would go outside and just find some kind of a, a bar slash restaurant where there would be a, a large table and uh, we would order some food and then all of us would take out our notebooks and start like preparing for the next game away from, away from the hotel because staying in that hotel for like three weeks straight, straight was a bit depressing. And he would occasionally join. And, uh, it, you know, it seemed like a social occasion, but he would also always show up with a notebook, even though he did not have a next game to prepare for. And he would be sitting there, you know, chewing the fat with us and, you know, enjoying the time away from it all. But there was also always going to be a chessboard on his screen where he would be checking something. So, I mean... You, you still you still have to work, but then uh, the results are spectacular, and you get lauded as the lauded as the new um, savior savior of of creative chess. So Dubov is the savior of creative chess. I'm gonna unmute somebody real quick. I'm gonna mute Austin. He has a question for you. Austin, you're unmuted. All right, so my question is, when I was watching a lot of top-level uh, PNWCC Blitz games, I saw a lot of Rook and Bishop versus Rook end games, and I noticed that the side with the Rook and Bishop almost always won, even though that end game is supposed to be a draw. So my question is, should I learn how to defend that end game since it seems to be reasonably common in Blitz play and Grandmasters have difficulties defending it? Yeah, 
the, the, the issue is, in particular in a Blitz game, you will still, I think, occasionally lose it, even if you learn how to defend it, because uh, you get slightly panicky uh, on, on like 10 second increment and so on. But yes, I would absolutely recommend spending some time perhaps defending it against an engine. Uh, also, you know, finding some kind of, I'm, I'm pretty sure there must be, you know, manuals or perhaps even online courses where you can uh, just find the, and I would, I don't know if that's the, the, the right recommendation, but I would actually recommend you stick with the, with the Cochrane defense, with the Rook sort of far away and pinning the bishop and the opposite opposite your king rather than the uh, second rank defense um, i think the issue, it, then can we would it be hard for you to just very i don't i don't know how to like i i don't know this software well enough to actually like All right, sure. it's, it's very i mean the, basically so I explain it i could share but i mean you know it's funny in uh let what's me the name of that tournament can... the champions um cup like the the thing you played in recently oh there there it is hang on uh, uh but peter what was the name of the tournament the skilling open is that is that correct? yeah the skilling open yeah, yeah so something very funny happened in that tournament is vidit gustrovsky i'm pronouncing yeah. his name wrong but vidit had rook against rook and bishop against anish giri he lost mm -hmm. that game and then a few rounds later he had it again against nakamura and he drew I don't know. Yeah. Did he, you think he actually but, studied it but, but but I think in his case he just it's just like you know sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. I think he lost one and drew one. I don't think he studied it properly between games. I'm pretty sure yeah. he knew how to draw it. So I think this is called the Cochrane defense. If I'm I'm it not is, sharing, yes. let me You're finish. Correct. I am sharing. Yeah. yeah so yeah, this I'm is the Cochrane sure. defense where basically you you're you're defending from uh you know from far away. And once, let's say, the king goes to the side, your king starts running in the opposite direction. And the, the second rank defense is this setup, basically where, let me just make some moves. Uh, the point here is that, uh, have I already lost? Probably not, yeah. Uh, well, well, imagine uh, the king on d3. Yeah, so. let's, let's, let's move some, let's make some moves. Yeah, like you go rook g2 here, that actually is the correct, the correct way to do it. Because if there's a check, check, like if you if you go uh, check, check, you go king of one, and the rook cannot stay on the second because it gets attacked. And basically it hinges on the fact that you always have this resource. Um, but the issue with this, uh, and the issue with the Cochrane defense, honestly, as well, is that, like, I think the the, the, the only, like, famous time when I had this, uh, this setup, uh, this material uh, in my entire career was the game against Fabi. Uh, in the Moscow candidates in 2016, where uh, I, it was a very interesting game. I was maybe even better at some point, and that was much worse. And then I missed a way to make a very study like immediate draw somewhere on move 50, and I ended up defending rook and bishop against rook uh, as a weaker side. And I was defending uh, this setup quite nicely for like 35 moves. And then Fabi finally managed somehow to sort of rotate the board 90 degrees. I was defending it, I think, with black on uh, on like the king on c8 and the rook on b7, b7, this kind of a setup. And then he eventually got me to uh, to drive with the king forward towards a4. And I tried switching to the king on a4, rook b5, rook b3 setup, and I somehow couldn't. And I started panicking. And at some point, it was, I think, if he played absolutely perfectly, he was winning the game before 50 moves if he if he did it absolutely perfectly. Uh, but we were both obviously playing on increment, and uh, uh, he missed uh, he missed the the immediate win, and then it was no longer possible in the fifty. And then he actually let the king go, and by the time I claimed fifty, it was just uh, just a draw again. But I, I think the issue with defending this end game is if somebody is good enough to like you set up a defense with the king on d1, let's say, and they realize you understand how to hold it on d1. And they are good enough to rotate you to the side of the board without, you know, losing losing too much time. You do get slightly disoriented, in particular in a blitz game, and blunders happen and people lose. Like the most striking example to me was I, I was playing this Zurich tournament uh, maybe two or three years back, and Nepo won rook and bishop against rook against Kramnik in about fifteen moves. And I thought if Kramnik can lose rook and bishop against rook there is no hope for any of us. Like it can really happen to anyone because trust me, he has enough culture to know how to hold this end game in general. And mm -hmm. he just lost it without a fight. He just started going wrong. And- Was he in he had, time trouble? 
Yeah, I'm, obviously it was uh, okay. it was a quickish time control. Uh, but yeah, I thought you know that this really shows that nobody is entirely immune uh, from uh, from losing it at a faster time oh, control. Yeah. Uh, I have a, but, I have but you do you do lower the probability by studying how to do it. So I have a question, but before we do that, I've never actually had to defend rook and bishop versus rook. But do you know the the idea of solitaire chess? Do you know what it is? Mm, nope. It's kind of like you you look at a top player's games and you guess their moves, right? Oh, so okay. I, I just I guess their moves, see how I do. I had bishop and I had to defend <laughs> rook against rook and bishop in one of those solitaire chess games. I was looking at Magnus's games from a tournament, mm. and he was defending against Luke Van Wiele, the mm -hmm. rook versus the rook and bishop. And I I had actually never seen the second rank defense, but that's what he employed. And so mm -hmm. I kind of learned. I was like, why is he not doing the the Cochrane defense, mm -hmm. but I managed to do it and not be losing at any point. So I was kind of like feeling good about the second rank defense. Um, I mean, it holds. It, it, yeah, it definitely I mean, holds. But probably in a practical game with like a lot of pressure. Yeah, I, th I think the Cochrane is slightly easier, but yeah, I mean, learning learning both is, is useful because there, there definitely will be situations where you can actually like establish this, but not the other one. Like okay. if you start from a slightly disadvantaged situation, like you you don't start with the king and the king in the center, you start with the king already cut off, yeah. and you just don't have enough time to go all all rook g eight rook d eight. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm gonna unmute uh, Tori. Yeah, there was actually a, a rook and uh, bishop sorry, against rook on on one of the top boards in the under twenty nationals that are going on right now. They finished yesterday, oh, yeah. I guess. Yeah, and. Uh, the the player defending it defended seemingly completely successfully, apart from one moment in the game where he made a mistake and he was getting mated against with precise play and it was missed by by the side with the bishop. So um Tori, you're unmuted. Um yeah. So I wanted to know if well you probably had, but if you ever had like a plateau where you weren't going up in rating in your chess career and like when did that happen and how old were you? Um, I had, I think, a couple obvious periods like this, like between maybe the ages of 13 and 15, and then maybe the uh, the next one was between 15 and 18, maybe not the entire three years between 15 and 18, but I was kind of stuck uh, amassing. I mean, as a result showed, I wasn't really stuck. I was just kind of assuming my next semi-final form as the, you know, as the quote may be, but uh, those things definitely do happen and uh, they normally aren't permanent. Uh, so they, they shouldn't be, you know, cause for despair. And as a kind of a funny personal anecdote, uh, I remember the first time I saw Vladimir Kramnik, there was uh, before I became a pupil of the Kasparov school, I played in the, I think that was the last ever Soviet under, under 18. We didn't have under 20s in those years. It was under 18. It was, I think, my second one. The first one I played, he wasn't there yet. But the second one I played, <clears throat> he came and he was, you know, touted as uh, this extremely gifted youngster who is supposed to be very, very good. And he did fine. He did better than me, but he was older than me by a year, which in, you know, I was like maybe 11, he was 12. So that's a big year there. That's a big difference, uh, obviously. And I think I scored plus one and he scored plus three in that tournament. Neither were, you know, anywhere near winning, uh, winning scores. And then he sort of disappeared from junior tournaments. And I thought to myself, well, that was that. You know, well, I mean, they, they, they told us he was very good, but they probably were just wrong, weren't they? Because he's no, he no, no longer there. And the next time I saw him, he was kind of winning every single game and went from being like 24-50 to becoming a member of the Olympic team and scoring eight and a half out of nine in his first Olympiad. Uh, and he like genuinely, I think, disappeared for a year before that and nobody saw him and he wasn't really making any waves or anything. And his rating definitely wasn't going up. Uh, so he, he, this does happen occasionally, and it's not really cause for concern, I think. Who is this player? Kramnik. I, I, I thought oh, I oh sorry. I didn't hear you say Kramnik. Uh, no. He, he did become somebody, yeah. 
Yeah, decent player, decent player. Uh, I'm gonna unmute Arnov. Arnov, are you ready? Sorry, I meant Aryan, Aryan. Arnov sent me a sad face. I don't know what that means. <laughs> Arnov sent the sad face, Aryan. He is probably, probably not very happy with the quality yeah. of entertainment he is being provided with today. Oh. And I apologize. How long in a day should you work on your strengths and how long in a day should you work on your weaknesses? Hmm. Uh, I think, you know, if, if you can identify your weaknesses clearly, that's already a huge step forward. And if you know how to work on them, you should probably be working on them. I think probably uh, uh, rectifying things that are going wrong is going to improve you faster than improving things that are going well. I don't know what I'm basing this on, but that's like the instinctive feeling I have. Like if, if, if for some reason uh, something is, you know, so glaringly obvious as being wrong that you can recognize it at such, an, uh, such a young age, because I think normally... Uh, you know, when I consider chess players of your age, uh, you know, weaknesses are just basically an experience. They aren't really anything structural more than they are simply lack of, uh, lack of experience, just that you will learn, uh, you know, the, the patterns will continue forming in your head and, and you will just eradicate them without even thinking about them very much. But if you know that there is something you just can't do well, if you've already identified that somehow, by all means, start by trying to get rid of that thing because that will, that will be extremely useful. I ask useful. you a related, a related question about that. Has there ever been a time in your career where there was something you were clearly weak at and you focused on it and got better at it? Sort of, yes. As the, uh, that's one of my most, fam uh, most favorite gifts that, that, pirate from i think it's maybe you know, trying to figure out where the where it is the pirate that says well yes but actually no uh this platform doesn't allow me to share gifts right uh, that's very sad uh, uh uh anyway uh the answer sort of is yes but the way the way i rectified it was just by basically by playing more uh when i started playing top top tournaments which was at the age of like 17, 18, when I won the, my, my first Russian and generally became a bit of a more known quality. And I was young enough and sort of interesting enough for people to start inviting me to good round robins. Uh, I was a very, very good dynamic player and I was absolutely rubbish at technical play and sort of positional play in general. And people could absolutely bore me to death. Uh, and you, you know, people like, I don't know, Boris, for instance, Boris Gelfand would just like run rings around me in, in positions where I couldn't, you know, threaten his king or start some kind of mayhem, mayhem on the board. Uh, but I never, it, it did become much better. I think I have become a much more, you know, well-rounded player, but I didn't do it by specifically studying uh technical positions i just did it by playing against boris more and then some mm -hmm. more and then some more and it's a kind of a you know sink or swim type type approach where uh if you're good enough you will just by you know osmosis by being next to good positional players by being beaten by positional players you will pick things up which they do well and you don't yet and you can try to incorporate that into your own play and you learn by analyzing with them after the game once again something that has sadly been going away uh you you absorb some of their wisdom uh so but it wasn't any kind of structural work it was i i knew i was weaker than them at that but i still it wasn't even laziness as such it's i i still don't know how you necessarily improve like positional understanding apart from being consistently beaten by good positional players and, and learning from them. So I have another question from Violet. I'm going to unmute you. Um, I was wondering what you think is the best time control for training games when you're not preparing for like a specific tournament? Um, that's, uh, let me think. I think any, unless you're trying to simulate the, the exact environment you will be playing in, uh, 
I suspect going slower than 20 will absolutely bore you out of your skull. I would suggest maybe even 15 plus 10, honestly. Uh, because I think I think 15 plus 10 is a time control where you already have uh, decent decent uh, you know a decent enough amount of time so that you can you can take maybe not one but two pauses to calculate. Once again, I'm basing this on absolutely nothing. I haven't really played training matches in quite some time, uh, and uh, I'm trying to remember what we were playing as training when I was helping Kramnik. That was ages and ages ago i suspect half of this zoom call wasn't born yet uh but i think we were like we were playing a lot of blitz but we were also playing some slightly slower games but i don't think they were slower than than 15 plus something maybe 20 plus 20 plus something in some very outside cases but i would really doubt it um i got some i got a question here is studying alpha zero a good idea? Probably, but I wouldn't know how. Like what, what is in being implied by studying alpha zero? Just like download a database and uh, just go through the games one by one. I don't think- I'm not sure. <clears throat> Going through uh, it, I, somebody said. No, I, I mean, I would suggest that, you know, it's not alpha zero, but it's, you know, the closest, that, the closest approximation that we have right now. You definitely should be, uh, using Leela quite a bit. Uh, and also I have found, I've, I've, I've not really been doing that. Uh, I think until I started working with Kirill for the candidates uh, this year. Uh, running both, let's say, Stockfish and Leela at the same time uh, provides a very, very interesting kind of an overview of two very different ways of thinking about the same position. You do have to be kind of mindful that if it's a very sharp tactical position, Lilo will be occasionally blundering mate in seven. But not kidding. I'm, I'm like genuinely not kidding. At maybe maybe the absolute latest version won't, but uh, they, they they still are significantly weaker at spotting immediate tactics than than non neural network uh, engines. But uh, that is useful. Um, but studying specifically Alpha Zero, I, I wouldn't know where to start. Um, I have a question. What's your best performance ever in Titled Tuesday? What was your best score? I, Did you I, ever win I, the I, like, knockout? No, I got, I got to the finals of the knockout once and lost to David Anton when there were still knockouts. Okay. That was very regrettable. I was completely winning in the first game with Black and then decided to go for something pretty instead of something practical, which I normally don't do, but I was also streaming and I felt like, you know, I should give my stream uh, a kind of a, you know, a, a decision with flair. And that decision with flair turned mm -hmm. out to be completely incorrect. So it was the people watching your stream. It was their Absolutely. Fault. I, bl I blame okay. the stream. Yeah. It's, uh, it's absolutely the stream's fault. Okay. Um, I have a question. Is now I'm getting some silly questions. Is playing tournament games with a hood? better <laughs> i don't think i've ever done that because generally uh i think the the, the tournaments i play and have this dress code thing mm -hmm. so they 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 limit my ability to do fun things with with wardrobe mm -hmm. but uh i mean being comfortable during the game is very very underrated i think well he said they say you have played title tuesday with a hood yeah, I, I have. I have actually so played. Yeah, have that you was... compared your results with the hood and without I've, the hood? And... I absolutely crushed the Swiss uh, playing in a hood, mm -hmm. and you know, uh, I think uh, sufficient time has passed that I can say that uh, we were. You know, that was Greg. Greg and Jen probably are the two people in this chat who know what I'm talking about. But uh, at least in the old days, there was those things called poker houses where. People would just rent a house and grind from it. You know, there would be like a large, large table and there would be like 10 notebooks on it and people would uh, play together. So that particular title Tuesday that I played in the hood was played from Kirill's place. And we were, yeah. uh, the Swiss portion we were playing, uh, I was sitting opposite Kirill 
and uh, uh, Andrei Yisipenko was sitting in the in, in the next room. We were not looking at each other's screens, but we were all three playing uh, playing at the same time. And me and Kirill actually got into the uh, got into the top eight. Both of us, we didn't play each other, and we both lost in the top eight. So uh, uh, that was kind of saddening because it was. For a second there, I thought it might be like a proper triumph for that particular chess house that evening, but we we did not succeed. Can I beat you now? Because I'm wearing the hood. You probably we played one title, right? I think you were. We played a title Tuesday, and we played in, on lead chess. And you know that game I, I played in lead chess. I was studying my openings really hard, and I like hit you with like a novelty almost that I had mm -hmm. prepared using. I would study it all the time in chessable, mm -hmm. and I got a good position. Yeah, I, I think you. I think you were much better at some point, but uh, it was like some kind of thing where I sack a pawn, but I knew it was good, and I've since studied it even further, so I would get a better position if I played it against you next time. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. yeah, somehow I I botched it up, and you you beat me. And then on on the title Tuesday, I messed the opening up, but somehow I kind of like almost came back. Do you remember this game? Vaguely, I remember it, beca it, it became it became a mess, but I think I kind of prevailed in the end somehow. You but did, yeah, it, it definitely became that. became a mess at some point. I wasn't wearing the hoodie, so it's not really fair. Yeah, this this thing actually doesn't come up very like this is the. It's I have two Nakitano fleeces, and one is is an, is an actual hoodie, and this one isn't. This is like the high as high as it goes. Mm -hmm. Is it um, better to eat while playing? No, you should not be eating while like. On a serious note, definitely don't eat at the table. Uh, that's uh, like like genuinely impolite. But also, I would suggest that probably like eating serious food during uh, during the game is is ill advised because it will redirect some blood flow to digestion instead of. No, like, this like is a, like a, a semi serious answer. I don't See? think like for, for for me personally, like it just puts me half to sleep, and uh, that's not very conducive to playing well. Are you suggesting only one cheeseburger per game and no more? I generally have some kind of a snack, like after move 40. <laughs> yeah. But until move 40, I try not to. Like, I drink water or I drink coffee if it's available there, but uh, I don't I don't eat. I was joking about the cheeseburger, everyone. Um, quick question. Also, wrong chess streamer for that joke. Do you uh, like to be a crewmate or an imposter? I am yet to play a single game of Among Us, which is extremely... What do you easy. think? Uh, do you like to lie or tell the truth? <laughs> I think I would be a horrible, horrible imposter. I think as a crewmate, I could learn to do tasks quickly enough and like I would be, I would be okay at that and I would just mm -hmm. so, silently vote with the majority at meetings. But uh, no, but like this is, this is so heartbreaking because the game is not dying exactly, but it's nowhere near as hyped up as it was when it just appeared. And when it just appeared, I had I had invites to the absolutely stunning lobbies. I could have played in some of the best lobbies out there. And I was just yeah. so afraid of looking stupid that I said no. And I'm regretting it. I'm, I'm regretting it every day. <laughs> um, so it's, it was a very, very poor decision. Somebody said, is it better to wear pants or shorts while playing? We're really getting to like... The whole 90 minutes was just to get to the real important question. Yeah, to, to, to the real, like, yeah, cut, cutting edge. Yeah. Uh, once again, sort of depends on whether whether they arbitrate for that. But I find, that, like, we, we're obviously talking about, although we actually know, maybe, you know, with the American crowd, maybe you actually mean, you actually mean over the board tournaments. Yeah, because, like, for me, this is a question about how I play online, right? It's mm -hmm. not really much of a question about official tournaments, but... The culture is different. Uh, we have had a famous instance of somebody trying to play a World Cup in shorts, yeah, and uh, that didn't go oh, particularly yeah. well for go anybody on. involved. Uh, Can we say final three questions? I'm fine. Uh, I I feel like you know I've I've wasted enough enough time early on in the show that I shouldn't really be limiting how long it runs because final fifty questions. Probably not. Yeah. Um, I got one that's. I feel like it's familiar, but not exactly. What is the third worst move against the Dutch? <laughs> I think somebody I mean, asked. I mean, D four, five, and now top three moves, or, or what? oh, the third worst. Not the worst. Not the second worst. 
but the third worst. Okay, so let's. We don't want to hear the worst one. You don't even tell us. Just only the third worst. Um. I mean, night A three maybe. Night A three. I think the worst, I mean, it's it's actually not that easy to nominate the worst move in that position. Like, G4 is genuinely playable. Yeah, I mean, maybe F3. Yeah, King D2. Okay, King D2 is number... Eight. Ah, King D2 and Bishop H6, actually. Yeah, uh, yeah I, those those weren't actually the moves in my head. Okay, if we, if we think those are the worst two, and they are, third worst is the actual, like, worst but limit, sort of legal move in this position, yeah? Yeah, F3 is not great. Uh, I was going to say B4, but they Can do play, play this B4. Board? We should put this on the board to follow. Me. Yeah, hang on. Uh, uh, yeah, default position. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, if we exclude King G2, which we should, and we exclude Bishop H6, which we should, I mean, this is kind of ugly, but they do actually play B4 in, in, in some Leningrads with the pawn steal on C2. It's not entirely pointless. A4 is, A4 is kind of pointless, but like once again, it's not going to hurt your position very much. Let me ask you this. Is there any move that white could play here where white is slightly worse? Other than those two, king d2 and bishop h6. Um, I think you might actually be slightly worse after g4, if g, h3, g3, g3, h3, g3, but I'm not entirely sure. Like I, I don't know what this position is supposed to be. Um... People are saying queen g2. I don't think queen g2 ruins your position enough. I think I think you can still switch to some kind of b3, bishop b2, g3, bishop g2. You're not going to be in too much trouble. Although, mm -hmm. like, knight f6, knight e4 is now becoming a topic. Yeah, maybe queen g2 is not great. We're going to have to put this in Nila. Absolutely, yeah. Solve those burning questions of the day. Um, have you ever underpromoted in a tournament game? Yes. Non-ironically, uh, like to actually, because it was the best move. Uh, no, if, uh, I have a feeling I have, but like the most the, the most famous example is actually against me, not by me, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that's a very hurtful game to remember. That's a game I lost to Vladimir Malachov in one of the World Cups, where the final move of the game was G two takes E one knight check. Oh. Um, but I'm pretty sure I've also done it but i can't recall off the top of my head the the situation where it happened um we're gonna we gotta we're gonna stop in just a minute so we gotta ask one more question one more who has a good one send it to me all right send me the question write it down i don't even know what that question means oh you got 30 seconds to answer this question. Are you ready? No. <laughs> I'm never ready. Is, is Hearthstone bad? Uh, yes. Yes. All right. Uh, but, not <laughs> a, but not in a way you would think. Oh. What is uh, it? I mean, it's, 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 it's very addictive. And uh, uh, occasionally I get people coming into my stream noticing I'm not playing chess and, and asking... You know how easy it is to get into this game so that you know i can i can follow what you do better and my my normal e instant reply is just don't uh there are probably better ways to uh, to destroy brain cells but i i am sort of pot committed by this point i have spent the last five years or maybe even six by this point playing the game so um all right, thanks so much for coming on and spending time with us. I hope everyone here had fun. I'm going to open the chat for the last minute so you can all say something silly. Um, much appreciated. Uh, great to see all the members of the U.S. Chess Girls and Women's Program. It was super cool having you. And, you know, next, I don't know which day of the week it is, but on the 29th, we have Irina Crush, and you are more, welcome. You are more than welcome to come again. We hope to see you all there. Uh, everybody have a great day. Thanks for people watching on Chess Dojo. M Happy holidays, everyone, too. All of those things. Yeah, thanks for having me. I hope I haven't been too useless. I, like, no, I you're genuinely, the I, I never know. Bye, everybody. Cheers.